Let me turn my phone off before it makes noise. All right, that's done. <clears throat> and we are live. Welcome to the Home Lab, Episode 3, Firewalls and Switches. This is Tom Lawrence and... Jay LaCroix. We are progressing right along here. We wanted to get these kind of foundational ones are going to be the first episodes. And there's as this show evolves and listening to all the feedback we get from you, uh, one of the things that we will be doing, so for those wondering, in the future is diving deep into individual topics like an individual self-hosted project or an individual firewall or use cases. Uh, but the first shows and episodes, you know, as we're getting our bearings as how we want to take this in what directions, uh, we're going to be doing these overview ones just to give some people foundation. And also the podcast uh, may, by the time you're listening to this, be live with the other episodes. Uh, they're being uploaded as of today, March 24th. And so if you're watching this live right now, they're not available, but in a few hours, uh, they should be able to be consumed wherever you consume podcasts from. And you'll find everything at thehomelab.show. So we do have an official site for all this. So you'll be able to find it. And we're ripping the video out of this and putting it over there. The YouTube channel will remain. We're still going to keep doing them live here. But you will also be able to just get this as a podcast in the future. So if you can't participate live or you're listening to this not participating live, this is our plan is to make it you know easily and more available for everyone. <laughs> and easier on ourselves, too. We're keeping it simple. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at the website, yep. uh, you'll probably find there's not much there. That's kind of the plan. We don't really plan to keep much there other than the podcast. Um, that's kind of the goal right now is to make it easy for you to consume, easy to get the data. But we won't dwell too much on that. You can go ahead yep. and check out the homelab.show to see all that. Let's dive into today's topic, and it's talking about firewalls and switches because, well, you got to connect all that stuff in your home lab, and there's got to be a way to connect it. <laughs> yep, you have to connect A to B. And, man, this is a... Um, Hotly debated topic for sure, but at least I'll mention because I don't want to get too off topic on the physical wiring part of it. I did a recent video on building your own home lab rack. I will leave that link in the show notes so you can easily find it on my Lawrence Systems channel. But I did a video talking about the components and the patch cables and stuff like that. I will agree those are greatly important, I, but I think those are harder to really discuss in depth on a podcast because it, there's such a physical aspect. And aesthetics are what people will start really focusing on in that particular topic, going, I like the thinner patch cables. I don't like modular, or I do like modular patch panels. Personally, I prefer modular. Fight me in the comments. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> but the uh, that topic, you know, I do address some of that and what cables you should use. And maybe there's, if there's enough interest, we, we will address that uh, because, I mean, there are different things like DAC or fiber. And I will get uh, one thing out of the way. Uh, this come. This is like every time people start a home lab is, hey, I'm building a new house and I want to have home lab in it. Should I run fiber all over my house? And 99% of the time I'm going to answer no. Let's get that part out of the way. Right. Just run the latest cable as of today. That's going to be Cat6. And if you can spend a little more and you want to get Cat6A because Cat6A will do 10 gig over greater distances than Cat6, go there. So there's our whole uh, rant on some of the topics related to the physical layer in terms of the cabling. But now let's get to the real topic. Let's start with a switch because the firewall is going to be a fun topic uh, at the end where yep. I know the comments will go crazy because there's deeper opinions probably on firewalls than there are on switches. The yep. common home lab switches, though, I'm going to start with Unify. Uh, I, I think Unify mm -hmm. makes a one of the easiest platforms to learn how VLANs work. And then there's going to be someone commenting, it doesn't teach you how VLANs work because they make it so easy <laughs> that you don't really learn the Cisco way of learning VLANs and how trunking works because it's a little pull down with a web UI and it's not all command line driven for uh, setting it up. But that's actually, in my opinion, if you can get a VLAN working and you can get some of this stuff functional quicker, it's up to you then. You If you're like, cool, I see how it works. Now, how do I add another component to this? Because the way the VLANs work is a standard. So if you get it working on Unify, I think it builds up a little that confidence to be able to do it elsewhere. But for some people, Unify is perfectly fine. Like that, they, they're not going to dive deep into the networking. What do you think, Jay? You like Unify, right? I do. I love it. And, you know, it's kind of interesting for me because um, the reason why I went to Unify, not just because you kind of turned me onto it, but um, in my home where I was living at the time, I literally bought every single router at the uh, local store, Micro Center, and they all failed me. And obviously, wasn't anything wrong with the routers. They're okay. It's just that the house was a really hard thing to get things through the walls. 
And I even bought a $400 router, took that one back, and I bought a, I think it was $99 I paid for a Unify access point, and it won. It, it, it got the signal everywhere, all over the house, not a single um, blank spot anywhere. And then from there, I unified all the things. But before that, I was doing everything manually with, um, you know, Debian and IP tables and all that. So I, I lived the do-it-yourself life for a long time. And then I got to a point, okay, I know that stuff fairly well. It's time to make it easy on myself and go with Unify. And I like Unify quite a bit. I just installed the doorbell like two days ago. So just to give you an yeah. idea. They definitely make a lot of different cool projects, uh, you know, outside of just their core thing of switches. Now, you mentioned routing, and but I don't want to conflate this. The routing, we I'm not a big fan, and we'll get to that when we talk to the firewalls, of the Unify routers. We'll talk about more of that later. Uh, for a lot of routing, me and Jay both use PFSense. But before you call us fanboys of only PFSense, uh, we will mention OpenSense and a couple other ones later. But in terms of switching, if you need to get your switches set up, you need to get uh, things going pretty fast, pretty easy. Granted, yes, it does have a controller system that you have to load. So there's a software control plane that allows you to manage many Unify devices. Now, there's a turnoff to some people have to Unify. And if you're someone building your home lab and you only have one switch, running a separate piece of software to manage one switch seems silly. And you're kind of right. Uh, but I don't know too many home labbers that are really into it that didn't buy seven more switches within the first year. You know, <laughs> it's it's all it always starts with a single switch. And one of the cool things that Unify has is like those mini switches, those uh, little 30, I think they're like 30 something, $39 for the tiny ones, the little four, five port ones that also support some of the VLANs. So that's, um, there are some, you know, slowly you can expand in there. They have 10 gig models. And when you tie them all together, having everything in one control plane starts to make sense. Now, a few other models that I'll mention that are going to be pretty popular, uh, Mikrotik. And Mikrotik is probably has the best bang for the buck when you want to go 10 gig. That I've reviewed the little Mikrotik uh, four port, oh, technically five port, four 10 gig ports, one uh, RJ45, uh, one gig port. And that little switch by Mikrotik, there's nobody in the price range of $130 that offers a four port 10 gig switch right now that I'm aware of on March 24th of 2021. Um, right. the, the folks that serve the home, um, someone said it's actually $29 for the USW Mini Flex switch to Flex Minis. So yeah, Unify, I mean, that's a one gig switch. I actually have, um, I was using one as a port tap for a while for uh, doing some testing with Security Onion. I don't know any $29 switch that you could use as a port tap as easy as you could a Unify one. It's like you could just do it in a little drop down and away you go. But back over yep. to the Mikrotik. So Mikrotik's an interesting company. Um, there's a lot of people that it's a love-hate relationship they seem to have with it going. They have a higher level of complexity when it comes to learning it. But that complexity, once you get through it, and I always hear people, I don't know if this is them just throwing shade at them, but they just refer to it as Latvian logic because of where the uh, where they're from, of the unusual ways that they implement some of the things. Among the unusualness you find in like a Mikrotik 10 gig switch is Wi-Fi settings. And it doesn't have Wi-Fi because Mikrotik has a very extensive, not great UI and all the features are there. Even if they don't physically exist, they have the same software and all the, uh, when they create a series of switches, they all have the same software on them. Whether or not the features are there doesn't really matter. You still have all those options, which creates um, kind of like that analysis paralysis. People look at it and go, which menu option do I choose again? And I don't know if you, have you looked at the Mikrotik switches, Jay? No, but I was actually thinking about buying one based on your recommendation because um, I want to actually go back to 10 gig. I was using 10 gig for a while. Um, long story made short, I switched away from it and I miss it now. So I kind of want that back. And then um, I was in a chat room um, and, and someone said, hey, Tom mentioned that this is a really inexpensive 10 gig switch. I'm like, okay, sold. I'll go buy one. So I will have an opinion on it, but unfortunately, as of today, I have yet to check out that unit or anything made by Mikrotik. Yeah, the uh, the Mikrotik stuff is, it's interesting because one of the other options you have of a lot of models, I have to look this up ahead of time with some of the Mikrotik models, but they support Switch OS. 
and they have their MakerTik OS, their router OS. Uh, it's not actually called MakerTik OS, router OS, and then they have Switch OS. Switch OS is basically a lesser version of the same software. It runs on the same Switch. You don't have to reflash it. It's like a mode you can put it in essentially, and it does reboot into that mode. Now, the cool thing about that is that makes it a lot easier to use because instead of having all those functionality, it narrows the scope down to switch functions. So you can set up your VLANs, you can set up uh, some of the more basic things. Now, a lot of the MikroTicks actually support routing within their switches. Um, I don't believe that's available if you use a switch OS, you want to use the router OS if you want all the advanced extra routing functions. But for a lot of people, they're going, nope, I just kind of need some 10 gig hooked up and I might need a couple VLANs split off and that's where they're uh, stopping, which is fine. And MikroTick also does allow some command line configuration. And I talk about them from the home lab perspective because home lab frequently means starting out without the budget to buy a Cisco or some of those. And hands down, MikroTik really hits that price point that is just killer. They they have some uh, switches that there's they're in their own price categories and we can really describe them. Now, one downside, if you buy three MikroTik switches, that does mean you have to configure three of them. This is where back to like that we mentioned with Unify, having a single control plane can be really easy where I, I define a VLAN, it automatically is defined in the other ones. Now, granted, there's ways to do this in all the other major switch manufacturers, but the uh, Maker tick, like I said, it's a little, it's a little strange, and I already see comments uh, in the live stream that people saying yes, it's a very complex UI. That's definitely for sure. Now, a couple other ones worth mentioning are going to be like the Edge devices. Now, this is made by Ubiquiti. It's a different line of their. Uh, switches, the edge ones. The edge ones are actually pretty nice too. Um, I, I don't have any issue with the edge switches other than they have a configuration that's probably more traditional looking uh, when you, I've done a couple of videos like how to do VLANs in them. Uh, it's not like the Unify and this is where people get confused thinking the edge line will tie in with the Unify platform and be easy to use. Nope. They just have their own kind of web UI for setting up switches and things like that. But they're actually usually on the same price point as the Unify one. So they don't, if you're choosing between the two of them, you kind of go, well, I may as well get the one that works with this larger control platform that's really easy to use. So that's uh, there's nothing wrong with those. And the last part I'll touch on on a switch is, is there's a ton of great deals you can get on used equipment. Uh, that's been pulled from data centers that's 10 gig or faster from a lot of different companies. I actually would say check out Serve the Home and they do in their write-ups and on some, especially because they write up uh, and have done some videos on older model switches and talking about what deals there are in there. And I think some of them are made by companies like Brocade. I mean, these are some were extremely expensive in their heyday, are much more affordable now and you can you can build something out there. The downside and be prepared is those devices are going to end up um, having an even steeper learning curve, especially Cisco. Uh, if you're not familiar at all with Cisco iOS, it's going to be difficult to you. If you're a Cisco veteran, then no problem. Just go for, you, you, then you're going to be in familiar territory and buying a used Cisco becomes pretty easy. Check licensing and make sure that you have all the features and nothing's going to not work if you get Cisco. Um, I see people mentioning a few other brands, other corporate brands. There's a lot of corporate brands, you know, Juniper being among them. You can always find those. They're not something you're going to buy brand new for the home lab, though. I'm going to throw that out there. I don't think there's any home labbers running out and buying uh, Juniper switches. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard of any, my, you know, on my end. So, yeah. yeah. The only Cisco switches that might be in the home lab category is uh, they make a couple new small business switches I reviewed on my channel. And there's a couple of them. They're their small business line, but they're Cisco. They nerf out some of the features. So they're not, they're Cisco, but not the same Cisco. Uh, Cisco hardware, but Cisco without some of the other features. And I don't think they're, they're, they're not a bad choice. And I did that review on them. But one of the things I highlighted was like when you wanted to do the switch stacking, which is a feature, even though they, there's another person on YouTube that may have claimed it was really easy and they automatically switch stacked. They don't. There's a lot more steps involved as opposed to something like when you're doing Unify, it's easy to do. That's one of the reasons Unify's popularity really uh, is the fact that they have built a really easy to use platform. That's been kind of Unify's ethos and goals. They want to really put this in the hands of a lot of people and make it easy. And they certainly did. We use actually a lot of Unify commercially and don't have any problem with it. It's proven to be a really solid product. Um, but, you know, 
it's it, it comes down to uh, where's your goals in your home lab. If your home lab says, I'm building a home lab because I plan to be a Cisco engineer, then throw out everything I talked about for the last 20 minutes and go buy a Cisco. <laughs> Yeah, what you use at work will probably impact a lot of people that are starting. And, you know, if you are working in IT, maybe more on the entry level side of IT, it doesn't hurt to let your senior level administrators know that your intent is to learn and build a home lab. And if they are going to recycle some equipment, they might just throw some switches your way if they're going to throw something out or maybe an older server, you might get lucky. Uh, I used to um, every now and then get some hand-me-down equipment and when I was first starting, and that's um, really awesome when that happens. And if you are wanting to work your way up in your current company, then it might just make sense to learn what your company uses because that would uh, you know, make it easier for you to learn. Yeah, and that's one of the best things about Home Lab is you, know, you could take it down anytime you want. And the worst thing you're going to do is make your kids angry or your other family members or whoever you live with when you, you know, the internet stops working, but you don't have like a whole company um, coming at you with pitchforks when you take something down. So you have the full reign to just, you know, every, every minute is a maintenance window basically. So yeah. um, a lot of flexibility there. So. Yeah. And I will give a quick shout out to uh, Jeff Aquino. He threw a donation in here. So we'll give a shout out to people to throw money at us uh, for this project. And it says it's his birthday. So happy birthday, Jeff. So <laughs> Eight plus equals one. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, the Cisco's I mentioned, I reviewed are the Cisco 1000s. And someone had commented as well that the, and you're right, uh, the UI is less than wonderful. Uh, so when Cisco does take the time to put a UI on a switch, um, yeah, just learn the command line because the Cisco UI is well, not not good, <laughs> not yeah. not um, not wonderful. Um, I will mention a couple runners up though. I've tested some of the Aruba equipment as well, <clears throat> and that's another one. Uh, Aruba makes a few switches now that are seem to be part of their new platform that do have a cloud enablement, but also have local management as well. And uh, those are another one that aren't a bad choice. Their UI is not bad. They they pack a lot of features in them. Um, and the nice thing is there's really not – because like things like VLANs, they're a standard. So you can have – and this is actually a lot of people build their lab this way, and it's a great learning experience because each company does it differently. If you want to learn VLANs, have four different switches and figure out how four different switches and get a VLAN to traverse four different switches. It's a great learning experience or a very aggravating experience. So um, that depends on where your perspective is. But I actually encourage that. Uh, I think I've done a couple of videos even talking about like – this is how you do it here. This is how you do it here. This is what makes a VLAN explainer video so hard to do because you kind of have to explain it with whatever switch you're using. And then you're like, well, it's implemented differently in this switch. And I'm like, yes, there's right. there may not there's a standard for how the packets are framed and how things traverse. So two switches of different brands have no problem talking VLAN to each other. But the implementation of how the interface achieves that is going to be different on each switch. Yeah, I wanted to also address a few comments that came in as well, just to um, make sure, because there, there's some really good ones, and, and a lot of them are to do with VLANs. And one comment is um, regarding switches, why are VLANs necessary in my home lab? And the answer is VLANs are not necessary by default. They're not a requirement. You can totally be fine without ever implementing that. And I, I waited multiple years before I did. But the reason why you might want to do that depends on what you have. Now, if you have four computers, you know, maybe two servers, two desktops in your entire network, and you put each one in their own VLAN, that's not really going to get you uh, much benefit because, I mean, you have four devices, right? So why it's necessary really depends on what you have and what you want to accomplish. Now, it was also brought up IoT. That, now, that's a really good reason for VLANs because... You don't need VLANs for IoT. It's just a good idea because you're separating the IoT devices and you can choose which networks they're able to communicate with by you know, implementing firewall rules. And I'll give you an example. On my VLAN for IoT, I don't let any of those devices talk to anything in my network, anything else, with a few exceptions. I have Home Assistant, which is a popular software for home automation. I'm not going to um, talk too much about Home Assistant today, but um, I do want Home Assistant 
which is also on that IoT VLAN to talk to my desktop because I want to access Home Assistant, but I don't want all my spark plugs talking to everything else. So, but I do want to talk to Home Assistant, which is my bridge kind of into that network. If that makes sense. And then my television, a, a smart TV, there's no way to disable the ads and it drives me nuts. So what do you, what do you do? Well, I just basically set a firewall rule, you know, cause that's on the IOT network as well, that that TV isn't even allowed to talk to the internet at all. It just can't escape the network here, but I do want it to talk to home assistant. So through home assistant, I can, you know, power on the TV or automate that. I still want to do that, but I don't want it to talk to the outside world. And one more example is my son has a gaming PC that runs Windows, no judgment. Now he hasn't yet, which is surprising, run into a virus or malware at all. But I kind of figured if one day he does, I have a YouTube channel, I have all these important files and things. I don't want them, the malware on my kids' network to talk to my business stuff. So I segregate that with the VLAN so they can't talk to my devices. So why you want to enable a VLAN really comes down to what you want to accomplish, what devices you have, what what's important to you, and then you design your VLANs around what's important to you. The the other big advantage for VLANs is as you spider out your network and it gets bigger, um, you know, even our office isn't that big. Our office is only about 2,000 square feet, but we have a data pipeline going from the back of the office to the front of the office. We have a lot of connectivity at the very back where our servers are, and we have a lot of connectivity at the front where we work on customer equipment and things like that. It, we could run individual runs all the way back and have a non-separated network, but by trunking everything in, putting it all into one trunk that comes down uh, the hallway and brings it up front, we're able to create a series of separate networks. As a matter of fact, because of the way we have things segregated at our office with several networks for different testing at different times, VLANs make it really easy. Just go take a switch port and say, make this switch port, this particular network right now. Um, I even have a lot of advanced things set up because we'll get to the topic. I see people already starting to comment on about virtual firewalls, especially when I create virtual firewalls, we have a series of VLANs that are only for some of my lab stuff. So I can create virtual firewalls and virtual systems and then put them all on a separate VLAN, but then physically bring them out into the real world to plug in devices. And VLANing just makes that really easy to do, um, especially when, with the virtualization stacks, just tie it all to a specific VLAN, and then you just make those ports, you bring them and trunk them down to only be that particular VLAN. So it becomes kind of a uh, easy way to manage all of that. But we should probably start moving over to firewalls now, because that's... Uh, and I will mention, though, because we didn't talk much about wireless, we'll probably do a separate video on that, that we could probably just talk just about wireless as its own, because there's a lot to it, because I, I want to dive deep into the wireless yeah. topic. There's a lot there. So yeah. we just wanted to talk about switches and firewalls. And trust me, there's we don't have any shortage of topics. We know that's one that we want to dive into. But um, mm -hmm. firewalls, we're going to start with what me and Jay use, but don't take this. Um, I, I don't know where... There's a lot of uh, people that think that I'm only recommending people use this. I just happen to use a lot of PFSense. So I do a lot of videos on PFSense. So that is, and PFSense is hugely popular in the commercial market, has been for a long time. And yes, uh, save your um, uh, keyboard typing. We're aware of all the problems in 2.50. I did a video about that topic. So we're completely aware that there are some bugs and uh, they are working towards the release candidate on there. But uh, PFSense has been a popular project. It forked from Monowall. It is now comes in two flavors, which of course adds to a little bit of the confusion. They have the P PFSense um, Plus, which is the one that comes with the NetGate hardware that at some point in the roadmap, they do plan to sell it as an upgrade where it's based on the open source tools, but has a little bit of proprietariness added in. It's still an open source project at the back end, but you would be right to say the final product is not open source. This is not uncommon for a lot of things where they bake in a couple of special things, but they still have PFSense CE. 2.5 right now, and Community Edition is still open source and the code's posted on GitHub, despite what people keep commenting on YouTube, tell me it's not, you can go see that. They've kept that part open source. Now, whether or not that means speculatively that they will kill it off, I will let the commenters argue that out. Uh, but for now, as of today, it's an alive project. So if you want to think something's happened later, 
feel free to speculate. I don't need to do that. Um, but PF Sense is one of the things that's made it popular is the fact that it's extremely flexible. They really baked in a massive amount of functionality inside of a firewall. So you have a free radius server. You have a captive portal system for those of you that want to have a specific network and authenticate people with a captive portal. Um, it breaks out a lot of really advanced rules. Some of those rules are even able to uh, stack rules together. There's a lot of unusual use case situations we've come into where PF Sense was kind of like the easy way to solve it. And one of them is the way you can take one rule and create a tag that gets added on a packet stream to then go filter out differently again later to apply it to a different rule if that tag exists. Uh, you can also even filter the rules based on what operating system it detects in the stream that was used. I mean, they have you can go kind of crazy with it, which is what's made it such a popular product is, sure, routing packets is easy, but when you want to route packets and apply a lot of functionality to them, that's where the firewall complexities come in. And uh, PFSense has always done that. But not going to have a problem. Uh, well, what's your thoughts on PFSense? You've been running it for well, quite a number of time, right? Yeah, like, I want to say four years, maybe five. Um, you know, you you mentioned, and I, you know, PF Sense quite a few times, and then at PenguinCon, you did this panel about it, and I think that's when I decided to use it. And that was around the time I was using Debian, basically, as my firewall, and I was manually using IP tables for everything, which is not, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I felt like it was a valuable learning experience, but PF Sense was... Um, I have to say it fits perfectly, and I think people could accuse me of being a PFSense fanboy, but um, the reality is it's really hard to tell the difference between someone who is a fanboy versus someone who just found something that works super well for their use case, and they're naturally going to speak highly about it. So for me personally, PFSense is great. I mean, I can drop an entire, uh, you know, access to an entire VLAN on a schedule or something like that. Like my, my kids go to bed at a certain time, cut their network, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you don't have to worry about um, hearing Netflix until two in the morning. So you get all this control and you can basically be as creative with your firewall rules as you are creative. And there's all kinds of things that I did. I have a separate network for VMs, IOT, kids, like I mentioned, my, um, you know, devices network for, for, you know, computers and phones, for example, I think I have like eight different VLANs in there because it just, I just went crazy with it. And I love the fact that you could just say, all of these devices can't access anything except this one. This one can access something and this one can access something. You know, I gave the example of my television, my smart TV, I could basically disrupt its ability to download ads from its server, which all the ad rules I've added didn't really help. I swear, you know, cutting its access to the WAN that seemed to stop it from being able to download ads. And since I have all this control, I just really love it. It just works well. Yeah, and, and one of the really popular plugins, of course, that uh, PF Sense can't be mentioned almost without its most popular plugin, PF Blocker, to give you a lot of the DNS sync holding and things like that, which it's kind of a way to run. And you can even use some of the similar feeds as a pie hole. Pie hole is a different project, but in the same concept of what they do, um, PF Blocker will allow a lot of extra DNS stuff. And, and I have a uh, chat with a developer. Actually, me and him were chatting last Friday night. Uh, if you can go support that developer, BB Can, the developer of that, uh, awesome. He's got a Patreon page. Um, but definitely a great project. And the fact that it can pull in some of the pie holes makes it a really popular option. Now, I will mention PF Sense. You can run this in hardware or virtual. So you can just download and run it on whatever hardware you want. You can buy an appliance from NetGate or you can run this virtually. It does support XCPNG, Proxmox, and Hyper-V for those of you that uh, like that. Oh, and VMware, of course. I mean, I mean that almost goes without saying. Uh, you can build uh, HA systems with it as well, uh, whether it be hardware HA or virtualized HA. Because I've talked to people who have built um, multiple systems for running it virtually, but then also have it set up in an HA. They have an entire system that can be done this. I've broke down how to do uh, a lot of things in there. Now let's talk about another firewall, OpenSense. I, people think I don't like it. I usually just say I don't have a use case for that. So what happened is there was a disagreement between developers. So fork it, because that's the open source way. <laughs> we, we don't like something, but we think we can deploy it better a group of people will get together and fork a project. 
OpenSense uh, decided to go with Harden BSD and they forked the project. It's, I don't remember exactly when, but it's been a few years. If you like OpenSense, use OpenSense. OpenSense is a, from everyone who has told me, I don't run this, so I'm not speaking directly from it. Uh, OpenSense does have a, a good user base. It's got a popular forum. It seems to work perfectly fine. The only thing I've noticed it from a business use case, one, we rarely have ever, ever seen anyone running it in businesses. I'm not saying no one does, just are, you know, running into it. We run into PF Sense all the time when we take over clients. We've taken over clients, you know, uh, from an MSP standpoint, like as a managed service provider, we take over from another IT company. We find uh, PF Sense all the time. And we see PFSense used in a corporate, but OpenSense, I have not run into one in the wild yet. But like I said, it's not me at all saying it's not used that way. I'm just saying my, my from my experience. But OpenSense is a, um, by understanding, quite reliable. It does have a lot of the same features. They have a lot more plugins. I don't know specifically, I don't have like a side-by-side -side comparison, but they have a listing on their website for that. I have no problems if people want to use it. People think because I don't do videos on it, I must hate a product. No, I just haven't taken the time to familiarize with myself with that particular product. Um, it does have, and someone mentioned earlier that because of some of the problems that apparently are with the code that NetGate sponsored for WireGuard, NetGate has since removed WireGuard from the PFSense project for now. But the OpenSense does have WireGuard already in it and has for a little while, but they don't have a kernel implementation. They have a user space implementation written in Go. And because of the way context switching and some of the details behind that work, your Go in impl implementation is not going to be as fast as a kernel implementation. But yes, it is absolutely um, something that is there, it exists. So you can do most of the same functionality seems to be there. The only other thing I noticed is they seem to update more frequently. And from me as a business standpoint, um, the newest bells and whistles aren't always what I'm looking for. We're looking for a stable, slower update cycle so we don't have to run out and update hundreds of firewalls that we manage because we're responsible for updating these. So cool that there's a new update every two weeks if you're excited about new updates. Um, not everybody is because we're more excited about stability. And so far, and yes, I know the PFSense 2.5 has bugs in it that I did a video about about some of the current issues with it. But yeah, um, overall, the, the migration path has been relatively slow, but that's okay because it works. So I have no problems with, uh, you know, with a little bit slower update path. I think I feel the same way. That's why I don't use OpenSense because I'm a little biased towards updates frequently when it's a Linux system, because for a Linux channel, that's great. New version of GNOME, let's go over it. Let's go over the new KDE Plasma desktop because these updates keep coming. So I'll download them as they come in. But since I have a Linux channel, I don't cover PFSense because it's outside the scope of my channel. So in that case, I don't want the updates frequently because that's a distraction for my channel since I'm not going to cover any of those updates. And that's the only reason why I don't use OpenSense and haven't checked it out. Also, because the process of converting from PFSense to OpenSense is not a straightforward thing. You can't just upload a config file. Well, you kind of can, but it's not supported. It may not work. It may blow up in your face, but you could try it. Probably won't work correctly. There are ways to convert a PFSense config file to OpenSense, but I didn't. I just don't have time to go through all that. And I know that there. Without getting into it, there's some drama. There has been drama that led to the split with OpenSense actually being created. And, you know, some interesting points are brought up there. But for me personally, it's what I implemented, a, you know, quite a long time ago. It's outside the scope of my channel. And since it has fewer updates, then it's less of a distraction for me um, because I have the new shiny syndrome. Oh, look, update. Um, and then I switch yeah. content over to that. So because it doesn't update, I could be focused more on what I want to do. It's outside the scope of my channel. But I could totally understand if you're a business, you don't want to update you know, that frequently because it's really hard for some companies to get a maintenance window. And think about that for a moment. Maybe at your company, it's not. I've had people comment, well, that's easy. I just do it in the middle of the night. Well, maybe it's easy for you and your business, but some businesses are have a hard time with that. So they would probably be more um, inclined to use uh, OpenSense in that regard. So I think it kind of depends on, you know, do you prefer the new shiny or do you want something that's stable, kind of stays out of your way and that might determine what you go with. Right. Now, um, the other thing too is like you build so much complexity into a firewall, it becomes a little bit 
harder, like Jay said, to switch between different firewalls. Um, we, a lot of times, in where my videos come from is the fact that we're working with these different firewalls. That's why I'm able to do the videos on them so I can talk a lot about the you know, features, but I'm working with some clients use this firewall, some clients use that firewall. And another popular one that I bring up a lot is going to be Untangle. Now, Untangle is open source with upsells. So that's the way I would describe it. So it is an open source project, but it certainly has upsells to it. And including in those upsells is it has WireGuard, but I, and I wish they didn't do this, um, so don't blame me. I don't work there. <laughs> they they decided that up, an upsell to you, the consumer, is going to be WireGuard. So you can get the firewall for free, but certain features like some of their web filtering features and threat protection features are upsells. And those make sense because those require feeds uh, from threat intelligence feeds to be constantly updated. You have to maintain that list. But they also decided when they added WireGuard, they made an announcement, and then they also simultaneously announced it's also only available with our home user versions or our, uh, they call it NG Firewall Complete versions. So the way Untangle works is you can get a license for the upsold features and you can work it perfectly fine. And one of the things I like about them as a company is it does continue routing packets if a license expires. The so license is for the upsold features. Now, like threat protection, as I said, it requires a feed. So people who want a, a web filtering system and all the extra protection that may come with that, and you want all those websites to constantly be indexed, that's a paid item on a subscription. They're reasonably priced. They actually have some special home user pricing because they realize a lot of people want to start using it in a home lab. And it's like $150 a year. So it's not free, but it's pretty good price for all the features you get with the home lab version. Or I think it's called home pro now. I said home lab, but I think it's they call it the home pro version. So it's not bad. And for some people that go, you know what? I want a really simple firewall that can do things like filter and tell me a report of where did my kids go online or, you know, create some rules to keep them off sites you don't want them on or block a certain site. They have a lot of those features and they did a nice job of building them into the Untangle firewall, but you don't get it for free. Um, that's the one side about it. And it, it's one of the more common questions people ask like, hey, um, can you also, uh, you know, do filtering in PF Sense? I'm like, it's just not as easy. It's a lot more steps. It's not one click. There's all kinds of, you know, more in-depth ways to set up things like Squid Proxy and stuff like that in PF Sense. It's all very turnkey and smoothly integrated in Untangle. So it comes back down to your home lab goals. Do you want to dive deep into setting up Squid and loading everything? Or would you like an auto installer that you click a button and block a website on a certain computer and just create a policy around it? That's where Untangle, I think, really kind of excels for that ease of use. That ease of use, though, does cost a few dollars. I have a lot of people that have uh, put this in. Even we've done a lot of businesses with it, that want all the advanced filtering and all the advanced options that come with it, and they buy the business version of it. But then the uh, we've talked to a lot of home users that they just like, you know, it just works. It's just simple. I want to play with Kubernetes. I want to play with all this. I don't really want to spend time filtering what my kids are doing. I just want to check a box and say uh, block uh, certain hub sites. <laughs> that they don't want their kids on. Done. <laughs> Just check a box, move on. Uh, we, we've blocked the casino. We blocked the gambling websites with a couple check boxes and moved on. So, hey, and, and, and for people looking for that simplicity. Another big thing that Untangle does, I think is rather clever, um, PIA Internet, Privacy VPNs. And PIA... Uh, is a pretty popular one. Uh, there's a few others. I can't remember it. I just remember PIA being among them. They built it into Untangle. So you can put your username and your password for your PIA account in Untangle and then say, route this box to go out PIA. And, you know, it's no secret. that Why did you get a privacy VPN? They call them privacy VPNs because we care about privacy a little. It's almost always because I need to torrent something. <laughs> what is going to stay in it, man? I need to torrent something or you're trying to get around a region lock to watch some type of content. People go, I need to pretend I'm in Europe right now or I need to pretend I'm in the United States. And this is what those VPNs become very popular for. And Untangle allows uh, through a tagging system where you just put in username and password to be able to quickly redirect. I have a joke, kind of, it's not really a joke video, but it's kind of a, uh, to show you how easy it is. I, I did a video on how to set up Untangle with PIA in five minutes. And I think the video is three minutes. <laughs> so, because you just drop in your username and password, you tag it. And by the way, it has some like predefined rules. Among those predefined rules, I believe, are would you like to detect torrent traffic and redirect torrent traffic on your network over PIA? Well, yes, I would like to do that. 
<laughs> they they know right. that's a nod to them knowing why people use it. So it's definitely um you know it's it's a nice it's a nice setup. I would say it's if you have those use cases, if you want things to be turnkey, um they give you less of the things to tinker with. It is Linux underneath, so it is running on, you know, like I said, it's got an open source base with some of their stuff baked into it. Um it it is have a decent UI now. If you go into it from the business standpoint, it's got a dashboard uh, where you can, can you can have a bunch of them deployed and manage them from like a central control panel. It they class up to all the business features. They get that. That's why they offer their uh, lab versions, so to speak, their home lab pro versions or home user pro versions. But I think it's a pretty nice firewall overall. Um, and once again, like I mentioned, with uh, Untangle, uh, Untangle can be. Uh, run inside of a virtual system, a virtual stack. OpenSense too, if I didn't mention that, OpenSense can be run inside a virtualization system as well. So either one of those are pretty good. Have you used Untangle at all, Jay? I have not. Yeah, I have no knowledge about that at all. But I yeah, I know basically everything you just mentioned now. So there's that. Yeah. So there's it's definitely um, one of the... It's a popular fire out there. Now, I've seen in the comments and Vios. Uh, Vios is pretty cool. It's a command line only firewall. And someone will point out there's someone writing some type of web interface to go on top of it. I looked at that briefly. I've not loaded it. The web interface looks pretty basic and incomplete. Like it, I don't think it covers all the advanced features. Maybe I'm wrong. I just looked at it. I did not actually try to install it. Um, Vios is actually a really neat project. And if you're gonna work in a data center, You'll find Vios in data centers. Vios is a uh, commercial firewall. I'm unclear. Someone said they charge a subscription fee now, but only if you want the latest version of it. Um, but Vios is a pretty neat uh, uh, firewall system. Downside being that it's command line only. It, it has a much steeper learning curve. But as someone pointed out even earlier, once you start learning things from command line, if that's the skill set you want to enhance, you can get really good because, well, what do you think about Ansible, Jay, and being able to script everything because it's from the command line? Yeah, and I that, love Ansible so much. Yeah. yeah, and these are the fun things. Uh, well, someone said Vios is a router first, firewall second. Yes, um, that's another way to look at it. It's a, a router with zones. Is I've there's a lot of it, it's. Yes, it's a firewall, but yes, it's a router. Uh, yes, it's used commercially. There's a lot of complexities. It has a massive amount of features. But one of the things about them is that learning curve. But the learning curve of command line also, command line offers you the advantages like me and Jay said with things like Ansible, where if you're running a data center and I have to make a change and I have you know, some type of automation tool that can send scripts out to my firewalls and be able to change them, BIOS is ready for that because it's already command line driven. Uh, and someone asked about the edge routers and the edge routers, yes. Somewhere back in the day, uh, I believe it's before BIOS, I can't remember the name of the software before then, the edge routers by Ubiquiti are a variation off of uh, BIOS. They have some of that baked in. I don't know where or how different their code is now than from the BIOS code. Uh, but yes, it is also similar. And the Edge OS is also Viata. That's what it was called. So Viata was the base. Viata got forked into Vios and Edge routers. So I don't know how changed the code is, but it's, it is it is a certain divergence we have seen on there. Uh, no problem if you want to play with it, but it's one of those, it's going to take some time and learning curve to uh, you know dive into and start understanding that. So those are... It, it's under option, and, and all these so far that we mentioned run on uh, x86. So, well, uh, Edge Edge doesn't. Edge is its own product, but um, PF Sense does Untangle and the uh, uh, P Open Sense. Sorry, drew a blank there. They all run on standard x86 hardware. And uh, someone asked about what's a good way to. Uh, buy some of the hardware for that, really, because it'll run on most anything. And someone asked about Protect Tele boxes. I don't know if you've seen these. Uh, their Protect Tele is the U.S. name, I believe, and someone may call me out on this. That Protect Tele imports them, but they're also go by a name Quotom, Q O T O M. We've got some of both here laying around at the office. We've been playing with. They seem to work perfectly fine. Um, they're usually solid metal piece. Uh, passively cooled devices. They have like four Intel network uh, ports on them. They make a pretty decent firewall. I, I don't really have any um, 
I don't really have any problem with them, so to speak. We've we've deployed them out in the field. They work pretty good. That might be what I'm running, actually. I forgot the name of it, but I have a metal box that is a Core i7. It's not like the most you know newest Core i7 generation, but it, it basically fits that description, and that's what I run PFSense on. Again, I forgot the name of the manufacturer. I bought it off of, uh, I think it was Amazon. You got it off um, Amazon. It was probably a Protect Heli. I, I think it is, and I'll tell you this, like, um, I was before this, I had all kinds of problems, even with Zoom calls, it would max out the CPU on my previous device. I have never seen the CPU on this device get above 2% running PFSense because I think an i7 is just overkill for a uh, firewall, but that's fine. I like overkill. I'm not going to max yeah. it out anytime soon. So it works very, very well for me. Yeah, and one thing about uh, firewalls, and this is a really fuzzy issue, is people always ask how fast they are. For basic routing, an i5 even, or even something slower, even you know, a couple generations ago, i5, you can get one gig routing. But where things start to break down is you're usually testing with something uh, when you're doing a speed test on a router, people will use, and I've done this myself, you're, you're creating single streams with a... Uh, What's that speed test tool I use all the time that's on the tip of my tongue? Excel <laughs> report speed test? No, no, not that speed test. Like the one you can run internally. Um, oh, IP, yeah. Uh, yeah. iPerf, right? iPerf, iPerf. I kept wanting to say IP tables because I've seen it in the comments, but no, iPerf. When you use iPerf, you're doing a single stream. When you want to measure a firewall speed, it's the, the single streams are pretty much always going to go fast. It's your... Uh, iMix traffic, as they refer to it, your iMix traffic is where you're going to be more problems. So iMix means lots of mixed traffic. And there's a tool called T-Rex by Cisco that you can set up to, to create the artificial traffic so you can actually start testing it. But once again, it's only when you start doing things like Sericata and Snort, which will start pushing the CPU. Because when you want to do something that's looking deeper at the packets, that's when you actually will hit CPU. So if you're running something like Sericata and you run not a single stream of data where it goes, hey, look, some streams are going from here to there. I love how many comments that are on iPerf right now because of the delay. There's, there's a whole row of them in the comments here. But when you're running a single stream like iPerf, it's not going to tax it as much. But when you have... 50 devices going to many different websites and pulling many different small packets from all over the place to, you know, use different services online, someone streaming YouTube, someone streaming Spotify, and there's just a whole lot of back and forth, all the different things you're using. Now there's thousands of streams that it has to look into that loads up the CPU and it doesn't become as much a speed issue. It becomes a, how fast can we inspect these packets and pass them along back to their destinations? So it becomes a little bit more challenging for how much routing you can do. And it's also why a speed test, even from something like DSL reports, may report really fast, but you may notice higher CPU usage and slowdowns later because, well, you've not gone to a few devices downloading a file. You've gone to 50, 100, 1,000 devices just using a lot of network traffic and having to keep track of all the states that are available for that. So... It's it's not as easy. Even uh, NetGate, they started posting their um, two different numbers for how their VPN speed works. Because if you have VPNs, you go, all right, well, how fast is the VPN? Well, running iPerf, we get this speed. Running iMix traffic using the T-Rex tool, we get this speed. So it really comes down to how many streams are in there and things like that. So you get, it, it, it's not as easy. It's not as cookie cutter. It's not like a, measuring a hard drive speed or a wire speed for two points going, how much data can I get from point A to point B? Well, what happens when there's a thousand different people that want to get a thousand different pieces of dissimilar data from point A to point B? And what happens with the pro packet processing that you put in between? Also, how many rules did you load in Sericata? All of them? <laughs> now you have a bigger rule set because let me parse this against a larger rule set other than a narrow rule set. So there's a lot of uh, factors that go into that answer. It's not, a, it's why when people ask, I'm like, I don't, I don't, I, I have to go into like a five minute explainer. <laughs> you can overload your CPU. Yep. Uh, someone pointed out, and I believe they're still doing this. I don't know the, on every model, but I know uh, some of the protect heli, protect helis use core boot as well. So if you're into um, using a better boot system, that is something that's a feature of some of the protect heli boxes. 
Now, last but not least, we started out mentioning Unify making good switches, but I, uh, I'm not going to give that same answer for their firewalls. Um, I, I, I feel as though their firewalls are better than something you can buy from a consumer, you know, go to Walmart and buy some consumer device. Do I think their firewalls are better than that? Yes. Uh, the USG line, which is actually a little bit older, USG Pro, or the Unify Dream Machine and Unify Dream Machine Pro, which are ubiquity devices. I like the concept that you get a single plane of glass. I can create my VLAN. I have the VLAN in my switches, my access point, and my firewall all through one web interface, except they keep falling flat with the way they implement things. I know there's an upcoming beta, as someone will point out, for things like assigning multiple IPs to WAN. This is a weird shortcoming to me that has been in the requests for years. Like when they released the Unify uh, USG series, it didn't have the ability to assign multiple IPs to WAN. And there's always someone that'll point out, oh, you just have to go and edit the JSON file and change configs and command line this. But the problem is when you do that, one, it doesn't always survive updates. Two, it doesn't always make the web interface work properly. So changes you make in a web interface may overwrite those changes, or in some cases we've seen, uh, it sends the USG into a boot loop because it doesn't know how to address the changes you made uh, to the system. So it can be a challenge getting things set up on them. Unify is also um, notably lacking in good VPN support and a lot of advanced functions just kind of keep falling flat with a lot of the Unify Dream Machine devices when it comes to advanced routing. For basic routing, I think it works. But the moment you start talking about any of those advanced rules that me and Jay mentioned earlier with the other devices like PFSense or OpenSense or Untangle, that all just starts kind of falling flat. And the statistics, that's another thing people ask. Like, it gives me deep packet inspection statistics. Go spend some time over in Ubiquiti's um, Reddit forum or their forum, and you'll find out how vague their numbers are. They give you usage numbers like, hey, this person used this much media data for streaming media. Okay, over what time frame? Well, we don't want to tell you that. We don't want to break down actual actionable information. We're just going to give you these cool charts that draw and make pictures on the screen, but don't give you actionable intelligence. <laughs> yeah, and they'll, they'll shame you in the interface every now and then. You go in the interface and you click on a section. You are not able to access this because you should have this device, if uh, depending on which one it is, um, that you're missing. And PFSense just integrates very well with it, in my opinion. So I've never looked outside of that. But when I ever, whenever I looked at these Unify um, routers, I'm like, yeah, it'd be nice if they had this feature and that feature. They don't for some reason. I don't understand why it's taking so long. It just seems to be like a weak area in their product line. Yeah, I I mean, writing firewalls is really challenging. It is not for the faint of heart. Um, and also, by the way, this is by no means an exhaustive list because there's so many options out there when it comes to firewalls. There's a lot of other side projects. Um, the open WRT and everything related to that. I have not touched that project in a long time, but yeah, it's out there. It's a popular project. I haven't used it, so I can't really speak um, as an expert on it because it's been, I mean, I played with it forever ago on my Linksys WR54T. Um, when were those relevant? How many years ago? <laughs> That's the last time I've used yeah. the project. So I, I'm so far removed from it, but I'm aware that there's still activity on those projects. Um, we're just talking about a lot of the ones that we use. Kind of the, to put some closure on Ubiquity stuff, though, I don't know if Ubiquity is going to get better at theirs. Um, I always have hope because someone was even asking me and tagging me in Twitter today about what, another update on the Dream Machine. Hey, does it address all the issues? I don't know. I have a Dream Machine here so I can plug it in and can load an update and be disappointed again. That's kind of my joke of why it's in the rack. We don't actually have it turned on at any given time. But when I know there's a new version and people want to say, does it still suck? I load, I load it, turn it on, and I'm going, yes, I'll do a video to let you know. They updated it to a new version. They solved these problems, but not any real issues. Or they made buttons that nobody asked for. Or they've split things into two different menus for reasons that I can't define. <laughs> that sucks 1% less in this update. Yeah, it sucks 1% less. So there's... Yeah. It's, it's like... Ah, uh, yeah, I want them to do better. It's not that I'm not hating on the company because I don't want them to do better. They are 
absolutely aware between me and other people who produce videos on their product, we talk about their shortcomings. There are feature requests that are long standing in their forums under their feature request headings. They just seem to ignore the fact over five or six years that, yeah, they just don't want to listen to people on it. And I don't know why. And there was all the speculation when they had hired uh, some more developers that they would change it. They hired people who were specifically talented at firewall development from other projects in the open source community. And everyone's like, oh, this is awesome. They hired so-and-so. And I don't know what that person's doing because we haven't seen a massive amount of innovation. Granted, there's at least some because uh, the USG line is not the same hardware at all or even the same really operating system base as the unified Dream Machine line. So maybe that person had a hand in that. But why did you guys keep the shortcomings? And those shortcomings such as not being able to do multiple WAN IPs and a lot of routing features not being there. Or why is an OpenVPN? I mean, OpenVPN is kind of an industry standard for any of these other firewalls we mentioned, but OpenVPN is just missing. And WireGuard, I don't even think that's on their roadmap anytime soon. There's someone going to point out there's a way to hack it in there. I'm aware. But once again, I don't think it's on. If you if you want Unify for their interface, then why are you going around their interface to get something done? You suddenly broke it at that point. Right. Like the whole point is... Um, you know, for a lot of people is to have an easy to use interface that abstracts the underpinnings, but then to be required to get into the plumbing kind of defeats one of the purposes that some people use that for. Yeah. Um, and also, it could just be the case, I don't know if this is true, that their developers are just spread too thin. That's very common, especially with um, with things like this, that there's just not enough manpower to make some of this stuff happen. Sometimes it's as simple as that, or maybe they're okay with the audience that they have with the wi-fi equipment maybe that's their bread and butter i'm just assuming that's the case i don't know if it's true it could be that it could be that there's just so much more money in the other things and that's where their focus is um it could be as simple as that too but it's really hard to say I, you know i think you know to, to a little back-end perspective i have on them would be the fact that uh you know i don't know anyone directly there other than when they used to send us stuff and i say used to because best i can tell they're not sending us anything anymore because i did some scathing reviews of their product and I, they dead air me when I email them now asking questions. Um, but the, uh, the the general consensus I seem to have is um, they just kind of get different directions sometimes from leadership inside there. That's the best guess. Like they're working on this and now they're working on that. And now they're going in this direction. They're, they're unified switching and access points we've deployed thousands of. And we manage those at scale. I think they make a solid product for its use case. They're not as advanced as you'll get with some of the other higher end companies like Cisco. You can't say they're a one to one match with Cisco. But do I need any of those extra features that Cisco offers? If the answer is no, then cool, I can go do this deployment. And we've got deployments with some of their um, equipment that, you know, like 300 access points and as many switches as needed to run all those. And I've done some reviews. We've been deploying them at scale. And because they don't need features that aren't supported in Unify. They have to always think about what's your use case. Do you need those extra features? But the routing equipment, I don't really deploy that for any businesses. It's really, yeah, not not as great. So hopefully, <laughs> uh, someone said multiple IPs came in with 1.92 weeks ago. So I guess I'll have to look at that to see it. But I don't know if that's a beta version or not. I I know the beta versions had it, but I don't I don't know if the release versions have it on the Unify. Maybe now it sucks 5% less. <laughs> yeah, because multiple WAN IP, cool. Where's OpenVPN and some of the other features that people look for um, in a firewall? Because, you know, OpenVPN integration, whether using OpenSense, PFSense, or um, Untangle, has been solid. Matter of fact, you can really do, a, there's a lot of flexibility in user management and everything with all of those, especially for business use cases or when you have a lot of people that want to log in remotely. Those all have a lot of advanced features around that. or of the aforementioned selective routing when you use a privacy VPN where you go, I want to send certain things for, you know, whether you're getting around a region lock or uh, torrenting your favorite uh, <laughs> distribution. Um, those privacy VPN functions are null because it's all command line and a lot of hacking going on to try to get them to work in Unify. If Unify wanted to, you know, help the home user market that is interested in those things, you'd think they take the time to develop them. But yeah, so that's kind of a... They, I don't think that's their interest level. They, um, I don't know. They just kind of fall short on that. I will give a shout. I have not used it. Uh, TNSR is another project from the folks over at NetGate. Uh, TNSR, just if you're not familiar what it is, it's vector packet routing. Um, it's designed for 
even higher scale, fast routing. I'm not an expert at it. They have their own write-ups and white papers. So you can kind of learn a little bit more about what vector packet routing is. Where it becomes like a use case is running it in cloud services like Azure and AWS. When you go, I need not gigabit speed, not 10 gigabit speed, but even more than that type of speed. Um, this is, it, it's supposed to be designed to solve some scalability problems for people that are running things at a very high enterprise level, especially like, you know, routing stuff in the data center. Not an expert at it. I haven't used it. Um, they do have some free editions so you can try. I, I don't know all the details of it, but I know I've seen they announced that. So they do have some free editions essentially. So you can go out and try the TNS, uh, TNSR. I think they want to call it Tensor. I, I'm bad with pronouncing things. It's, it's TNSR on their website. <laughs> Yep. Any any closing comments, Jay? I think we covered the major firewalls, or at least the ones that I, we have some knowledge of. I don't. I think that you know those are the things that I was thinking we should say. I, I think we covered lo a lot of options. I mean, again, I mean, there's quite a few things out there to consider, even things that we didn't mention. But there's just not enough time to check everything out that exists out there. As much as we would love to do that, but uh, I think you know, I think that covers it, in my opinion. Yeah. So um, I, if you have questions, comments, leave them below. We do check the comments on these. Uh, on, for those of you watching the live stream, and this is a post as a video. For those of you listening to the podcast, hey, awesome, welcome. And uh, check us out at thehomelab.show. This is Tom Lawrence with Lawrence Systems and... Jay LaCroix with Learn Linux TV. And thanks for listening, folks. Take care. Thanks.